you have two options. One, you get $10 million today. The other is you go back and you're two years old, but you maintain all of the current knowledge you have inside of your head. Oh, my God. Which one would you take? I'm taking ten million. Ten million to Easy. the bank. Easy. You don't want to restart no. life knowing I can still mess it up. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I can absolutely step off a curb, make wrong. all yeah. the same, break both mistakes. your feet. Come on, <laughs> compound interest, man. That's just think basic. about if you could go back and be two years. You could have no. your whole. You have moshing future for twenty five years. Do you know what you. this world was like when I was two years yeah. old? No, I can't even possibly imagine. It's, well, I think your salary. Did you have a mule or a donkey? <laughs> really questionable. Extra time starts now. Ah, oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental from the AT&T MLS Studios in Midtown Manhattan. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, Matt Doyle, David Goss, Kalen Carr, on his phone, yet focused here, <laughs> a true <laughs> millennial. Early he tries start to for hide Kalen. it behind his uh. computer, but what you don't know is that I can see you doing that and the, know. The best yeah. part is Kalen only brings the computer on so he can hide right. the phone. Does Kalen have object permanence yet like do you do you understand it's like a childhood thing right mm. like like understanding that the the object is there that you can see everyone else can see it as well wow i'm gonna take a little while to just soak that in right mm-hmm. now that was deep um Low recovery here yeah i heard something about like how many lifts you do a day yeah that was me on this show oh you did <laughs> Man, dude. wow you are really not paying attention <laughs> all right let's go Whoa, here we go we got Held a big up. show coming up we have no time to waste and we've already done a little bit of that uh jurgen <laughs> Locadia, new FC Cincinnati designated player and a budding DJ star. His influences wicka, wicka. off the field, Diplo and Major Lazer, which, you know, Dave's all about. Big ma- you Major Lazer guy? Lean on. Okay, perfect, yeah. perfect. Uh, we're also going to talk about Inter Miami's Jack move for Adolfo Pizarro after we ch- talk to Jurgen Locadia. Well, what, what is a Jack Yeah, move? what's a Jack move? You don't know what a Jack move is? No. When you other you guys didn't it's grow like up in Wichita, one. did you? It's when somebody else has something or think they have something and you swoop at the last minute and then you take it for yourself. That's a Jack move. Uh, I've heard people say, like, you jacked me, but I don't think that I ever knew that it came from anything. It sounds like a uh, Kansas moment. Okay. No, it's, it doesn't sound it's like, Kansas no, it's at like all. an old, it's an old hip hop. Now I feel like lyric, this is not it? a real thing because if you think you know it and yeah, they don't true. know it, then it's probably something that's not real and I made it up. So yeah. uh, Googling it right now. Yeah, well, go hit up some uh, Urban Dictionary and then let me know because I may have messed this one up. Uh, look, Inter Miami, they're making moves. It's slowly but surely on the roster building front for them. We also have the MLS News dump. Hijack. Hijack. Yeah see, yeah, yeah, see, it comes yeah. from hijack. There you go. I knew I was right. Yeah, uh, Sanders third DP spot is filled. Like they can't buy it down. Like this is not a placeholder tam player. Like in the summer, they can't go get a Nico Odero, but that also means that they're ready for CCO. Based Fever. on the current rules that you know of, that's a very valid <laughs> point. We're gonna talk U.S. national team. The kids are all right. They got a 1-0 win penalty. Uli. And his uh, first ever cap. So we assume finger. you didn't watch. So we're I did. No, I did watch. You. Yeah. But you, yeah. whoa, whoa, oh, was me. But, uh, I can't watch. There was no whoa. There was no whoa. <laughs> do we have anything good in the mailbag? Uh, we do. Okay. We're going to talk about how many teams have improved. Okay, that's oh. extremely Just general. Hard number. Also, Hani Mukhtar, Albert Rusnak, quick chats with them from L.A. We had to push Jonathan Osorio, so apologies, uh, Canada and Toronto FC fans. That will be coming very, very soon. And then on Thursday, we also have Nani, Bojan, and Pozuelo coming for you. So we do have some uh, some Reds flavor there. Heavy then. hitters. Yep. I was about to say, you could compete in the 2008 Champions League with that lineup of uh, <laughs> interviews. Hey, there's some best 11 there, too. Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Programming note for you. We have a lot of people asking about season previews and saying, hey, why is my team not in the rundown? Or, hey, why didn't you hear about my team on the last show? Well, Send us an email yes. or a text, and they will be in the exactly. rundown. Exactly. 401 206 MLS, extra time at MLSsoccer.com. Now, barring Ooh. that, if you cannot find a way to get Dave to read your text or email on the show, I'm not getting a lot of great stuff right now. Wow. I'm not going to lie. It Calling feels like the like fans that? are in preseason mm. or off season mode. Mm-hmm. Do you I think that's pre-season. the correct strategy for us to get more and better mail? Is to step up and you know, as managers, like, like literally antagonize yes. our, our listeners and viewers. Yeah, yeah, that, okay. that works. Yeah, All right, fine. sounds like that's uh, why I'm here. Sounds like our headlines. Yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. okay. <laughs> we wouldn't. We don't do that. Not with Atlanta no. United. Okay. Not with anyone. Uh, Monday. Ooh, Weeby got smoked on Twitter with Atlanta okay. United. Okay, we won't combo. talk about this. Okay. Monday, the seventeenth of February. It is a holiday. But our CCL preview will come out that day, so stay tuned there. And then the following Thursday, the 20th, Eastern Conference preview. The 24th, that next Monday, Western Conference preview. And then Thursday, the 27th, right before opening day, we have our prediction special and week one preview. And right now, rumor has it that Sam oh. Stachel is going to join us. 
Can I ask a question? Can we shake things up and go Western then Eastern? Sure. Why not? I, I, nothing's locked in. So, as someone who is an East Coast person, I expect to be put first, and I understand mm-hmm. that. But maybe like change the world a little. Fine, mm-hmm. slowly. One it's preview been, it's at a been time. decided. The twentieth is the West. The twenty fourth is the East. I'm very, uh, I'm very <laughs> flexible here. Let's yeah. get into it. The big news today: you saw him arrive at the airport in Cincinnati. Jurgen Volkadia. He is on loan as a designated player for six months. Then it's a two and a half year deal tacked onto the back of it. The option basically for Cincy to make it permanent is one of many loans for designated players, including the Sounders recent DP signing coming through Major League Soccer right now. A little bit of a trend. I'd like to know more about that. Perhaps we'll ask somebody or somebody will report it. Looking at you, Tom Bogert, Sam Stachel, Paul Tenorio. That would be nice. Wow, we're Uh, putting time in that. Yeah, I figured, you know, if we're calling people out, we might as well, yeah. Get, you know, let's motivate him. All right. That's what management is. All Play right, Doyle? Exactly. <laughs> they still have a DP spot due Cincinnati. Uh, because he's moving into a new season, he is exempt from the FIFA maximum three club rule because he was at Brighton & Hove. And then he went on loan to Hoffenheim. And then he scored four goals in 12 games, but he didn't really play after the winter break. And now he is coming this way, but they allow it because it is a new season for him. 26. He was a $20 million player two years ago this time from PSV. Um, Quick reactions before we chat with Jurgen. What do you think? This is different. This is not Cincinnati of, of yesteryear. Mm-hmm. These are a different profile of players, both him and Kubo and the rumors with Pereiro, and they're linked with more. They now have filled two DPs, and they, they told you, right? Nightcamp told you there was going to be three DPs, right? He said they will get a 10 okay. in this window. Now, whether that's a DP or not. They're well, linked right now with a Moroccan player who's out of contract. He would think he'd more probably winger, but yes. not be a DP. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think they can play an actual 10 in that midfield. To maybe. be honest with you, I don't, I don't think you could play a true 10 and Harris Madunian in together in the same three-man midfield. You need two ball winners. Get, like, get creative by, you know, create scoring chances by winning the ball and transitioning quickly and by relying on your wingers and mm-hmm. Madunian's ability to release wingers into space. But anyway, as for Lacadia, it does feel a little bit like Joseph Martinez in that he's a in his prime player. Joseph was a little younger when he signed with Atlanta, but in, in his prime player who was maybe not in the best situation in a decent club in a top four league, the talent's there. We see you can just watch his highlight film and you see mm-hmm. the talent and you look at the numbers he put up with PSV. It's the type of move that this is why you hire guys like Nykamp and Ron Jans because they have the connections to make moves like this. And then, it makes a lot of sense. And then you mentioned, I think, the idea, like the thought process behind it, which feels new. And the little I've seen of him, he likes to drop off and connect a little bit more. And Kubo, we know, is a guy who's going to float in and play as like a second forward, really. So now you're doubling down with a concept of this is how we play. This is how we create chances. You let those guys work together. You, you make Kubo's life easier. You make his life easier. And I agree with you. There, there seems to be some good upside to this signing. And there's also runway to make it. At 26 years old, a guy who hasn't been in good situations, if he's happy, if he feels comfortable, you've got a few years with him. And I like the fact that they brought him in now and didn't wait the six months for him to finish out the spring and see where he's at in the summer and maybe save a little money on that. Like, get him in preseason. Make him a part of this team. Make him a part of Ron Jan's group going forward. Absolutely. All right, let's talk to him. Look, there's only one thing better than the March in Cincinnati, and that's new DP signings, Dave, and they got a couple of those. Uh, That's true. The March is the best thing that happens in Cincinnati. (laughs) All right, let's welcome Jurgen Locadia to the show. Jurgen, what's up, man? I'm good, man. How are you doing, sir? We are doing really well. We're loving what FC Cincinnati's putting together, including you. Let's start with the obvious, which is why, Jurgen. Why Cincinnati? Why MLS? What was behind this decision for you? Um, Well, I've been in the States often, so I, I... I absolutely love it here. I love the people here, and um, I know the league is getting bigger lately. So, um, what's a simple decision for me to come here? Was this a fast-moving process? Was this months of sort of build-up, or did this happen recently for you? Um, like in, in a week, I guess. I heard about it like a week ago, and it all happens happened like in three days, two days maybe. So when this happens, when the agent or whoever it is calls you and says, FC Cincinnati, Major League Soccer, on your side as a player, what do you do? Do you go start watching highlights? Do you go start reading? Do you make phone calls to your friends? Are you hitting up Eloy? What are you doing? Um, first thing I did was like calling a friend of mine. He plays for Columbus. 
Oh my god, Eloy Room. <laughs> yeah, I called him, yeah. <laughs> and what'd he say? Uh, Did he have positive things to say? Yeah, definitely. He told me, like, the people are good here, the fine people. Um, Ohio is nice, and the weather is not nice, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the league is getting better every year, so it's, it's a nice Nice to be here. Since you signed, did he? Uh, you guys having a little banter now with the? Uh, now you guys are are rivals. I heard about it. Yeah, Columbus and, and Cincinnati are rivals. What was the pitch uh, from the club side from FC Cincinnati? Jared Nankamp coming in. What did he say to you? What was it that maybe got it over the line of why you want to be a part of this project? Um, well, he told me that Cincinnati um, just joined MLS like two seasons ago of last season and. Um, Basically building from the from the start, so I um, like the project. Um, it's all new for new for, for the people, you know, for the fans and, and for the people for the club. And um, I want to be a part of it, you know, to build something new and create new memories and you know maybe win the league. You never know. So that's why you know I wanted to join Cincinnati. It's new and it's a great start. And yeah, to make new memories, you know. As someone who came up, obviously born in Holland through Holland. How much did it mean to you that it was Nine Camp and Ron Jans that are putting this together? Did you know them at all before? Um, I, I knew Ron Jans. I played a lot of games against him in Holland, and but uh, Nine Camp I didn't know. That's the first time I met uh, Gerard here. Are you a center forward? You're gonna are you a, a ten? I think you're gonna wear the number ten. But I look at the depth chart and I look at your background and I think, huh, oh, they need a center forward. Where do you think you'll play? Where do you want to play? Um, I th- yeah, I'm a center forward, but I like to play on the left side also, or like behind the striker. It doesn't really matter for me as long as I play my games, you know, and trying to be important for the team. Can you describe what your for people who haven't seen your highlights or watched you play in the the Bundesliga or the Premier League or the Eredivisie? Can you describe what type of forward you are? Like, what is your favorite way to play, and what the fans can expect from you? Um, I'm like a strike with like when I go directly to to the goal, you know, no shortcuts, just make my action, make a step over, and just shoot on target. And um, I can shoot from distance also. Um, uh, my dynamic and um, I got a good shot on my right foot and my left foot also. So I, I read an interview with you, Jurgen, before the Hoffenheim move, and you said you were looking back to getting to be the player that you were at PSV. What about Brighton? What about Hoffenheim didn't work out? What's been missing for you over the last two years or so? Just time to play, you know, like playtime. The games I play, I score my goals in the Premier League and in the Bundesliga, but. Um, sometimes I just ended on the bench, you know, for, for no reason. So my goal here is like to play all the games and trying to be important for the team, score my goals and, you know, make the fans happy. You're a goal scorer. The first thing fans need to know, any signature celebration, anything that fans should know about coming into it? Um, no, not really. I'm just a regular guy, you know. <laughs> I'm simple. <laughs> You're a regular guy, but you're also I look, I checked out the Purple Art EP this Ooh. morning. I'm just gonna throw it out there. I listened to the EP, I like the EP. It's good stuff, man. It was a good vibe for my morning. Tell people about your musical career. I mean, it's you're a great soccer player, obviously, but you're multifaceted, Jurgen. Uh well I started making music like three years ago and um I think lately it's gonna get getting more serious. Um I had almost like a feature on a Tory Lanes also. But I get, didn't get through. I'm just waiting for his vocals for my next release. So it's getting bigger right now. And the music videos, uh, they, it's pretty, it's pretty dope, man. Like it looks like it's pretty high budget. Like, <laughs> this is this is not this is not hobby stuff. You are truly, truly pursuing this. Where do you think it can go? Um, I hope to end up as a DJ. That's like my passion, you know. Now, last one for you. Before we let you go, and I know you have a lot of media to do today as you get introduced to Cincinnati. There's a big one, Loka. Do you know what Skyline Chili is? No, I don't know. <laughs> let me explain it to you, and you can tell me if you if this sounds good to you, appetizing. Maybe you'll get it today, No, tomorrow. don't do that. It is spaghetti with chili on top. Do you, you know what I mean when I say chili? Like American chili? Well, like chili, chili, like... Like beans and pieces. beef and spicy chili on, on, on spaghetti. 
That's not a good mix, man. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound good no, on paper. No, it it's, doesn't. It, yeah. but, you just got to. We ruined it. Yeah. You, this is a big thing in Cincinnati, man. So you'll try it, and then later in the year, we'll get back to you. We'll see how you felt You're about it. You're trying to okay? get them caught up already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, not at all. It Loka. doesn't sound good to me either. Loka, just always say you like it. Don't even. You don't even have to ever try it. People from Cincinnati <laughs> will like you more if you say you like it. with chili on top. <laughs> yeah. One more thing before we let you go. I am the proponent of all things CONCACAF. You do have the ability to potentially represent Curacao. They are rolling right now. They've been playing very well. Is there any possibility that that could happen? Wow. It's a hard question, man. I mean, if I show my qualities here in MLS, you never know if I get, like, a call from the Dutch coach, you know. So I'll, I'll have to keep my options open, you know. Okay. Just know that I am I a proponent. I would never say no, but okay. I would never say no, like, but I want to keep my options open. I feel you, man. I feel you. We'll have to talk to Eli Room. Have him put the hard yeah. sell on you. <laughs> Hell is real now between Cincinnati and Columbus. Jurgen Locadia, welcome to MLS, man. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. There's our AT&T call to the field. Some more uh, chats coming up with Hani Mukhtar as well as Albert Rushnak. Go check out the Purple Art EP. I'm telling you, it's pretty good. Like, I was drinking my coffee, putting the rundown together, just jamming to some loca, as we now know, because we're boys. <laughs> we share a Do certain... we have the ability on the show to put it, like, picture in picture with the music video? I don't know, but they're sweet. Have you seen them? He's wearing, like, flowing white shirts, like and, that. you know, it looks like there's wind. He's not actually the one singing, right? He's the DJ, so he's putting it all together. But uh, let's talk about oh. Cincinnati and Big Picture. Because as we said before we went to Jurgen, it feels different. Feels like they are in the midst of sort of changing who they are on the soccer side. Of course, they changed the leadership. They changed the executives, and this was coming. What are reasonable expectations in 2020? I, I, first of all, I just love that this is that time of year. It's the most joyful, yeah. beautiful it's time of year right now. Everyone's good. Preseason camp has just opened. <laughs> all the coaches are telling everybody, hey, we want to play beautiful football this year. Enjoy your football. And then, like... Three weeks in, you go on a trip down to Mexico, you play some free preseason friendlies, <laughs> you lose four or five nothing, and it's like back to the draw. But I want to put, uh, let me push <laughs> that back. Was the that. Part That's where... just a personal experience. Yeah, no, Wait, sure. can that I just part. throw out here? That was the part I think I read the Vadim Demidov interview where he was like, Yeah, then we got like killed like 7 0 in a preseason, <laughs> and it was never the same. And it's like, it had never started. Yeah, it, it was never anything. Yeah. Night Camp, I will say, and in his interview with you, uh, what was it like maybe three weeks ago? At this yeah, point, whatever it was, it was yeah. great. Yeah, uh, he uh, it, it was brilliant. It was ab I did it. absolutely brilliant stuff. Dave, yeah. he was very honest, and he was like, "Words are words. Anything I say to you, any signing I make, doesn't matter. We have to actually put it in practice. Come March, whatever. I think they, I think they're March first, maybe, when they play their first game. So, what's reasonable is playoff flirtation reasonable? I mean, 100%. You, Kubo, Lucadia, you now look, they got two new center backs. I mean, they signed Pedersen on a free out of, I think mm. it was Sweden. They signed He's Madunian. like in the back end. Yeah, Madunian, Cruz will go back to the eight, you think. They're going to get another 10. So for starters, I think, one, if we learned anything from last year with San Jose, if you work hard and you have a cohesive idea of being competitive to get into the playoffs in Major League Soccer should be like a baseline given. On top of that, I would argue that they've added talent in a seems like cohesive way with an idea of how a team specifically will play. You've got a few left backs who can get pretty high up the field, a guy in Kubo who likes to pinch in and play underneath a forward. You've got a big, strong, powerful athletic forward who has great feet. Um, as Loka said, he can shoot from distance, but he can also get inside. And then you've got a deep-lying playmaker who you'll hopefully protect with guys who can do some running for him, a guy in Alan Cruz that – if he takes another step, could be a very good player in this league um, alongside of them. And then I've heard pretty good stuff about Peter Pedersen, as you mentioned, and they brought in Vander Woof. Vanderwerf. Vanderwerf. He got at the end of last year. I mean, he got he had some tough moments. Yeah. He had some okay moments. One of the 100%. toughest was the Joseph Martinez Golazo. So it's just, yes, they are better man for man on the field. They have a coach who's working with the GM in lockstep of the type of talent he wants. Now coming through a full preseason that can work with this team. So everything points to them being more competitive. But teams in MLS get things wrong all the time. So I'm not 100% sure. And you, look, you can't also overstate the dysfunction that was there for the first couple months of the season last year. <laughs> no, you cannot. You cannot overstate you it. Cannot. Like your expansion team who is... Firing your coach, what was it? Was it nine, nine, 11 games? Nine, Eight. 10, 11. I don't know. Anthony Hudson and Alan, I'm like confusing Alan how long it was. Right. It was so short. 
That is the ultimate in dysfunction. You went through a whole preseason, which all the reports were plans, ideas, hierarchy within the squad was changing on a daily basis. You let your coach go. You wipe your front office. You bring in a new front office. You bring in a new coach. You can't make that many changes to your roster, which wasn't good enough, and we had said that over and over and over and over. So last year, in many ways, I feel like not something to throw away, but something to look at with very open eyes and say, yes, there were some extenuating circumstances. Can this team make the playoffs or is it just flirtation? Is there a playoff team in here? Let's say they sign this 10, this Moroccan guy who's been out of contract. Or he plays on the right. Yeah, or he plays on the right, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Oh, you want me to guarantee right now that Cincinnati will make the playoffs? No, can we like they look like a better team, but like the the transfer window isn't even officially open yet. And the CBA is not signed. There's going to be a raft of signings across this league in the next two or three weeks. Cincinnati looked like a better team. Um, it's so like it's so hard to say they look like a playoff team right now because we have no idea what like most of the other 13 teams in, ML- in the Eastern Conference are going to look like. Okay, Loco, put a number on it. I'm trying to nail you guys down. Oh, you want a goal scoring? Yeah, I thought you were asking him another no, question. Like he was still on no, the, he's not <laughs> on the line. Obviously, he's I was gone. like, well, uh, I'll, I'll make the over under twelve and a half. That's over. where I think it's about it. Over. I like Look that. Me confidence. in the eyes. Yeah. Over twelve. Kalen, and a half. I'll go under. I just think it's tough with looking at that offense last year, and I know they'll have more pieces around, but I think I would set the mark at ten. I think you can get right around there. That would be a success for me. Weeby, I'm going over. Okay. I'm going over. Two overs and an under. Yeah. Are you, no, I, I just I just make the you lines. Set the you're line. Wow, you're just wow. Vegas. Then you back right out. All right. Hani Mukhtar, another year one project in Nashville. He will be the 10 for them. I chatted with him in LA. Let's take a listen to that one. We'll be right back. All right, 10 minutes with Hani Mukhtar of Nashville SC. Welcome to MLS. Thank you. Thank you. How's it feel to uh, be with this club, to be in this league? How did you make the decision? feel great. And yeah, it was a, in the end an easy decision for me. They, they really wanted me and it uh, feels great for a player. And yeah, I'm happy with my decision. How much did you know about Major League Soccer? Yeah, a lot. The, the last year was it on the zone. We could, we could watch it. So I watched uh, when it was up at night. Some games, so yeah. How late are we talking? How late at night? 3 a.m., 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> you were up late. You were. This is like research, man. You were really putting your time in. Yeah, of course. What did you like when you watched the league? What teams did you see that you were impressed by? What was it about this league, this opportunity that you said, okay, this matches for me, my life, my game? Yeah, yeah the game was pretty fast, and um, I really liked it. So it's nice to nice to watch many goals. So it's, it's really, it's really great. So for people here who may not know about your game, about you, about what you're going to bring, help us. Walk us through who Hani Mukhtar, okay. the player, is. Yeah, I'm an offensive midfield player and um, yeah, I'm technically gifted, uh, I would say. So yeah, I, I like to give assists to, to score goals. I would try my best to help the team to, to be successful as much as we can and um, yeah. We have goals, and I hope that the Hani Mukta can help Nashville SC. What did you think about joining a team that's brand new? Because you come from European soccer, where that's not <laughs> happening, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> like, so it's yeah, it's a it's a big thing, and I think it's a really really great opportunity also for a player. Um, and we, of course, we have goals. We want to compete directly, and um, yeah. Fits to my goals. Did you have any trepidations? Any worry that coming to a team that doesn't have years and years to sort of figure themselves out or to get the processes right? Or was it, no, 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 this is, this is something for me to build in my career, an opportunity, like you said. Yeah, I think, I think um, you can create a lot here because it's a new club. And um, yeah, you, you can help them to build it. That's amazing. That's not, you cannot do that every day as a football player or a soccer player. I saw the private jet, the PJ as we call it. They flew you in on. You got the you got the treatment, right? Yeah. What did you <laughs> well, think of Nashville? Yeah, it was it was great how they treat me, how they the sports director, the coach, the the CEO they really wanted me. So yeah, it was it's a great feeling for a player that you 
feel directly um, treated well. And so, yeah, I'm really excited to start with Nashville SC and uh, be successful. Who have you talked to? Have you done sort of like that on the ground research where you're calling your buddies, shooting some texts out? Actually, Do you have any actually, contacts actually that you actually know? I have just one friend, uh, or Jody Reyna ah, yeah. in, at Vancouver. And yeah, I played with him in Salzburg, Red Bull Salzburg. And he's a good friend of mine, so yeah, we was we was talking a lot about it, and he's he just told me good things, and um, so yeah, the decision in the end was easy, like I told you. What have you heard from the GM? You have Mike Jacobs. You have mm -hmm. different veterans now on the team. Have you spoken to your teammates? Have you met your teammates? Actually, not much, um, but yeah, with Mike Jacobs, I I spoke a lot, especially in the beginning, and yeah, we. We had like a good relation, so he gave me a good feeling. What was the sell? Like somebody comes to me and wants me to move to a new country and says, okay, this is the opportunity. I'm going to be asking a lot of questions. What questions were you asking? Yeah, of course, what the, what the goals are and um, where they see me and where they see Nashville SC. And um, yeah, we want, we want to compete. And yeah, as a football player, especially me, I want to win. So... Hopefully it will be great. What's next for you in your career as you make this move? Why is this the right move for you right now as you sort of plot it all out? Yeah, I'm 24 and I have still still space to improve. And um, especially especially the Major League Soccer it was growing a lot of the last years and they will grow a lot the next years. Mm -hmm. So that's that fits perfect to me. And I'm 24 and I can, I can develop a lot and hopefully we develop together. What do you think you're going to develop? What are you looking to do here? Is it adding goals? Is it adding production? Is it winning championships? Yeah, is it winning, winning. That's winning. that's about it in football. I think, of course, um, yourself. You have to play good and score goals, make assists. But in the end, it's about winning and titles. So that's. Who are you? Like, who are you as a person? As a person. Uh, yeah. What do you like to do, man? What's your? I like to play FIFA. Really? Uh, yeah. Like I have my own. How you call it? Like. Do you stream? No, no, no. I don't stream. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too bad for that. But uh, yeah, I like to play PlayStation in my my free time. So yeah. Do you have? Do you do the ultimate team? What do you do? Yeah, ultimate team. Who are the Who are the players that you that you build your team around? Neymar and Ronaldo. No, oh, how can you not? <laughs> how can you not? Do you get yourself into that team? Have you? Played? No. Yeah. Oh, you do. Yeah. So nice. it's it's nice. Yeah. What do you expect when you move to Nashville? How will your life change? Will you bring family with you? Will you bring a, a wife, a girlfriend, kids? Maybe not. No, not yet. But yeah, of course, um, my parents want to come to the first game uh, against Atlanta. So um, yeah, I, I think I will be alone. But of course, um, my my best friend, he think about it to come to, to live with me in the beginning. But yeah. I will see. We have one month preseason, so afterwards I will make a decision. Stay on the road and figure it out. Yeah, exactly. What are you looking forward to the most as you plot out the season? You have that first game. You have Atlanta. You have a new city to explore. What are the things on your sort of, of course, personal checklist? Of course, for me, the first game against Atlanta is the now because it's close. It's close, and so yeah, I'm really excited to to play the first game and can't wait to start. All right, we can't wait to see you. Hani Mukhtar, Thank you Nashville so much. SC. Thanks for joining us, man. Thank you. Big expectations in Nashville for Hani Mukhtar. They brought him on the PJ after all. And the preseason result that mattered, kind of, for this episode is a nil-nil draw for Nashville against Elfsburg, I think, in their first preseason friendly. So we have the roster here, the lineup, I should say, in the first half. Joe Willis started in goal. Back line was Eric Miller, Dave Romney, Jaleel Anibaba, and Daniel Lovitz in the midfield. Excuse me. What? What's written down? What? Dan Lovitz. Oh, it is yeah. written down, Dan Lovitz. I don't Man. know if that was our website. You're like the high school Dan? friend who happened to go to the same college when someone tries to recreate themselves. <laughs> and they're like, hey, I'm like, I'm Reggie now. It's like, no, your name's Reginald. Right. And it's like, no one calls me. I now. couldn't. I'm sorry. I just What up, Dan? Yeah. Annabelle Godoy, Dax McCarty, Mukhtar, and Alan Wynn uh, in the midfield. I guess Wynn and Dunlady probably wingers yeah, here. Yeah. And then Baji center. Yeah, probably. then Dominique Baji up top. What do you think of that? First needs, run out. Needs work. Needs work. Not entirely uh, shocked that team ended up scoreless. So we got to say Randall Leal, obviously. Yeah, that's Costa a big Rica. One. Um, that's a big one who will be in the starting lineup. 
I don't know. That was mainly what I had to say. And then they have a Colombian <laughs> center back who I think yeah. hasn't been in. With yeah, and Jack Mayer is not in there as well. Yeah. Beckles is not in. So you'd think no, Beckles played in, in the second, second, second half. half. I think yeah. Mayer played in the second half as well. I don't know oh. that Beckles is the starter. No, Rio. Beckles or Beckles? Beckles, probably. Okay. Good job. Thank you. Okay. I Just appreciate check. you. So, yeah. Help me out there. All right, Rodolfo Pizarro, Inter Miami. As Look we, it up uh, on your phone. As we defined it, a I played against him a bunch. He's actually an, he's got an incredible story, and I know maybe we've been going into the tactics, but I'm just going to hijack this. But okay, go for he, it. He's been. Uh, but watch out because you don't want to lose an episode of the movement. Well, no, I, I, here. Yeah, okay, maybe I'll hold. No, on. no, I'm telling you to do it. I'm just warning you how much content you want to let out for yeah. free. How, how do you want to trickle? Yeah, I want to work with him. He's a really interesting yeah. guy. I'll leave it at that. Just put that in the ether. Yeah. Put that out there. I need the to come universe. to Nashville this year. It's absolutely out there. Yeah. Get this man to Nashville. Cool. But I'm going to the opener, if anybody is. I just, if there's a cool. march. Yeah, the opener is too intense for me. Gotcha. Honestly, you can handle that. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Rodolfo Pizarro to enter Miami. The rumors well, are heavy. So, Chicago, you had the rumors for a long time. Now you don't have the rumors. And Monterey Sporting Director, Julio Davino, you might know him from uh, FC Dallas, also L3 and many big clubs in Mexico, said in an interview in his stopped car, a classic, classic Isn't transfer Harry, deadline Harry day thing? trope, yeah. that is, that Pizarro likes the idea of Inter-Miami, mm -hmm. but the transfer will depend on Miami matching the buyout clause. That Pizarro, he said, Pizarro's not for sale necessarily. He mm -hmm. just has a buyout clause, and if you match that, of course, then what can we do? It triggers the clause, and if he wants to come, well, I guess uh, Rodolfo Pizarro is coming. So what... Uh, what does this mean? Is this a good thing? There's so been so many names that we've cycled through with Inter Miami. It's hard to keep it all straight. It's hard to figure out where they're actually going. Misdirection, deals that fall through, money that's too much. Rodolfo Pizarro, does so, he fit and why? So one thing is he played for Diego Alonso at Monterey. So he'll be very familiar with the coach and as one of probably the, if not the, you know, foundational signing, they'll be in lockstep. He is more reliable and more consistent than Roger Martinez would be in terms of, like, this is your one big DP that you're building around. Really, you really going to apply the term consistent to Pizarro? O over Roger Martinez. Okay. I and mean, this is a he Roger plays Martinez more, yeah, stand. I understand the flaws in Roger Martinez. Okay. I just refuse to acknowledge them. <laughs> um, you just did, though, but that's fine. Yeah. Continue. Uh, and I guess you could say he fits into the pieces they have currently. I don't know how much that matters in terms of this one big signing and that he could probably play on the wing if that's where they want to put him, or he could play in a midfield maybe alongside Lee Wynn to start the year or instead of him. Um, so all of those things make sense. Seems like all, we've talked about it already on the show. It seems like a lot of money for a guy who, and as Doyle alluded to, he covers a ton of ground. I think he works pretty hard for an attacking player. He normally isn't the guy with the final pass. He's normally not the guy who scores the goals. And I guess you could say with Chivas he was the leader, but he hasn't really been – the guy for any of the teams he's played for. And it looks like his national team career with Mexico has sort of stalled. So it, there's a surprise to see that this is the guy, but if you bring Alonzo in and he, this is someone he's comfortable with and you realize it's starting to die out with the Chicago negotiations, then I guess you have an opportunity to get in. It sounds like according to, to Paul Tenorio, a tweet he put out, it sounds like Chicago just kind of passed. They did, They looked and they decided that they wanted to go in a different direction. Um, which is understandable because Pizarro has a ton of talent, but he has not uh, he has not put it together in terms of consistency in any like entire season. I think he had one pretty great. I think it was the Apertura with Chivas, and when then they was, won the title. Yeah, and then he was awesome in uh, the Champions League, um, and he was really good in the Champions League last year as well. I thought, but like in terms of week to week performance, it hasn't been there. But also, he's a guy who sold for seventeen million dollars or something like that twice in the past three years. So and is very consistently a starter for Mexico in the last year. Yeah. So it's is he? Yeah, I think he's like. Yeah, but this the like Nations League hasn't been starts. Tata's "quote unquote" okay. A team, and there haven't been that's fair a, some of the European guys. But around. like, the, there's no question the talent is there with him. Um, Diego Alonso feels like he could turn him into a best eleven caliber player in this league. Um, well, you hired Diego Alonso for a reason, yeah, and he's turned players into forty million dollar transfers in the past, and that's why. And part of this is talking to the manager and. Miami had to build for a while without a manager, and we had questions over who's going to fit, how does it fit, but so much of a player's success does come down to 
the manager, the relationship. We saw this with Tata Martino, what he was able to do in Atlanta United. McDonough goes out and trusts Alonso to say, hey, is Pizarro a guy that can really be the guy for us? And I'm sure Alonso says, yes, that's maybe why Chicago doesn't want to take a risk because they don't have maybe the same infrastructure or, or setting around a player like that. And the, the bust boom part starts to not way out in the same type of dynamic, especially with that type of price tag attached to him. So I, I think that's why Miami probably feels more comfortable to take a risk on a player that has a lot of ambition at one point, supposed to be, you know, going to big clubs all over the world. And maybe this is an opportunity for Alonso to tell him, hey, come here. This is your opportunity. This is your path forward. Give me a couple good years, and then we can realize your potential. And I apologize. I understated their relationship. They work together at Pachuca as well. Because Alonzo was the Pachuca right. manager. Right. So this is someone he knows very well. Not just the year or eight months where he was at Monterey. This is a guy who I think he brought into professional soccer. And then they sold him for $16, right. $17 million to Chivas. And yeah. then Chivas sold him for $16, $17 million to yeah. Monterey. And now Monterey are going to yeah. sell him for whatever. Yeah. So this is a guy, to Kalen's point, that Alonzo probably knows as well as any current pro player that he would be bringing through to Yeah, kind of a two-time level up there. Now, Atlanta's conversation, or excuse me, Miami's conversation always revolves around this sort of do the DPs match sort of the vision. Did you just call them Atlanta? By Not accident? on purpose. Nice. Give me a break here. I've already Ooh. had enough. Me and Atlanta have already had enough <laughs> tough times in the last six, seven days. Does it? Uh, should we just throw out the window this idea of Miami as, at least initially in this moment, being – the place where all the sort of glamorous stars will land because that's sort of either we've been sold that or we've assumed that or we've wanted that somehow from sort of the start of the whole David Beckham and now the Moss Brothers Miami experience, there's always been this expectation that they're constantly working against, which is that their DPs will be Cavani, Suarez, yes, there, there will Silva, be, there'll be a certain Messi. international name recognition and Rodolfo Pizarro is a great player. But he might not have that international name recognition. Now, he will have it North America. Yep. Does it matter? Should we just throw that conversation out the window? Did Should it matter I? for LAFC? Carlos Vela is maybe a different profile than Rodolfo Pizarro? I mean, international global icon, I'm not sure I'd put him in that category. Okay, mm -hmm. that's probably fair. And, and, they, and LAFC proved that that mattered none. I guess Atlanta United Atlanta also. United? To Atlanta come back to well. Atlanta United, yeah. sorry. I think, but, but I, I would I argue think it's that that soccer fans now are sophisticated enough to to be like, we just want an exciting, good team. And I think if you were to ask the majority of people who are already MLS fans, I, I'm, I'm I don't have data on this, but I would imagine more of them would be excited to look at like 23, 24 year old players who you might sell to Manchester United for. $30 million or Newcastle United for $25 million as it is than they would be for guys at the end of their career. The the needle, like you got to thread the, the needle in terms of, um, okay, but what about people who aren't MLS fans? And that's, that's the question, right? Will, will Pizarro break into the but, sporting zeitgeist in South Florida? Now LAFC did that in LA. Atlanta did that in Atlanta without a David Beckham or Thierry Henry type of signing. But I'm sorry, Pizarro isn't Almiron. He's 27 years old. 25. No, I don't... He's 25. Uh, no, yeah, he's 25, but, but This is still. classic Doyle. Nice. He just threw you on, a, on an 25, age. He'll turn 26 in 10 days. So he's when 27. is he so, getting sold for so a... 28. Yeah. <laughs> when is he getting sold for a big number to a big team in Europe? Like, this is his move. Right. If he comes here, this is where he plays until he goes back to Mexico or finishes in MLS. Okay. So I don't know that it fits under that category. And what I would argue about Almiron and I think Vela because of their profile is whether or not they were traditional designated player signings. They were game-changing signings in MLS history. So the way they signed Almiron at the number they did with the plan they did was something we'd never seen before. It was Atlanta putting their foot down, this is who we are. And I think Vela at his age, his profile as a Mexican national team player coming to MLS was next level. Pizarro's not different than Pulido. He's not even that much different than Zellerion, oh, although I, I, he has oh, that I similar I completely, I completely, no, completely disagree different. with those two yeah. comparisons. He is not a starter for the Mexican national team okay, entering his prime, plays, and there's no plays, sell on. But he plays more than Pulido, and he's for three sure. Years, and he's three years younger. But going into World Cup qualifying, he's back off. And he's a he's a more important player at a bigger club with bigger price tags. Pulido's at Chivas. He was at Chivas. Yeah, Chivas. Okay, have, success, they've sorry. won successful. They've won, they've won as many titles club. in the past dozen years as Atlante. Understood, but like Chivas are. 
are a fallen but giant. But when you look at the Pachuca guys that came out, and you're talking about Chucky, and you're talking about Gutierrez, he's not even on that list. Like, he's not. But he was three years ago and when he, he played for Diego Alonso. Okay. He was considered at that level playing under this manager. But also this with manager, those guys. Th- okay. I mean, it's not a slam dunk. It's not a, a tap-in, if we want to keep our metaphors <laughs> soccer-specific. Like, th- there are more variables than um, – I think there was for a Vela type signing, but like th- this is not the signing makes sense. What if he's a Ladero? Right. What if he, Ladero? Yeah. They, there's no sell-on fee coming for him. Or I, just, I think he's 30 years old now, but he's, there's two titles on the on the Seattle crest stars, right now, yeah. right? So I, I think it doesn't have to be this either or of it's an Almiron or or it's or it's worthless, right? And it, to me, if you bring a player in that you feel that like can be the cornerstone of your club, like a Ladero, for a long time at 26, and you by 30, he's given you some titles. I mean, that would look pretty good. They would probably take that. Yeah, they might. They also have a captain, or at least a former captain, of the Columbus Crew. The legend, Will Trapp, 27 years old, traded from the crew to enter Miami. Paul Tenorio, again, on the front edge of this reporting. Uh, 100000 in GAM and an international spot to the crew. 200,000 K, uh, well, that's a double, Oof. double negative there. 200,000 pending performance triggers could also go to Columbus in this deal. It feels small, but then you have to remember that Miami are going to eat this TAM contract that Will Trap has. And Will Trap is in the final year of his deal. And Will Trap had reported interest from uh, the championship about a year Blackburn, ago or I think so. 1.25. Yeah, so, and he has the passport. So he could, let's say he's saying, oh, you know what, I'm going to go at the end of this. There's a lot of things that go into that price tag. They also made official uh, Nico Figal from Independiente. That's a good He sign. recently made the bench for Argentina and friendlies in 2019. One of those against Mexico. He's 25 years old, probably a center back. And I, then I just wait. I just need to make this point on Figal. If you want something that that really illustrates the the shift in perception in MLS um, towards MLS from Latin America over the last five years, Nico Figal is in his prime as a soccer player, and he's trying to make the national team, the Argentine national team. If he had come to MLS in 2015, 2016, that would be it. He would never, like, they would never have looked at him again. But he still came here because he knows. And we saw it last year with Piti. Piti still got called into national team camps for Argentina last year. And Tate Castellanos, by playing well for NYCFC, made himself a regular for the Argentine U23s. So if you want it, like something that crystallizes the shift in perception of this league and the shift in reality, I think, as well, the fact that f- players like Figal are signing here now. Lewis Morgan from Celtic also signed a winger. Seems more like a depth play, you would think, but maybe get some spot starts. TBD as they fill out the roster. And Mateus Villasanti, who we've heard about with Atlanta a lot, from Cerro Porteño, reportedly they're in the running for him too. But right now, the Pizarro deal, as we tape this TBD, it feels like it's trending toward yes. Trap is done. Figal is done. And Morgan is done. They're pushing forward. Can we talk about the fact that Will Trap just got acquired for $300,000 in allocation? 100 probably. I'm looking at Vancouver, Houston, RSL, New England. I'm wondering where those phone calls were. And I get if you're Columbus, you got to do right by a guy who's really mattered for your club from your city, especially with what he went through with the potential of moving and how he stayed a rock as part of that. But it shocks me that that's the going price for Will Trapp right now. All right. We got to uh, get out of here. Albert Rusnak is coming up in just a second. After that, Sounders third DP, more of the news dump and the mailbag. We'll be right back. Over to Rusnak with the right foot. What a goal! Albert Rusnak, his eighth of the season, just blasted by Sean Johnson. It is 2-1 RSL. Ten minutes with Albert Rusnak of Real Salt Lake, who I hear is a podcaster now as well. You trying to horn in our territory? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, I kind of got sucked into it. Um, I didn't have a an option, really. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. You know, I'm getting used to it talking into the microphone instead of being on a camera so yeah, you know yeah i think i'm getting better but yeah we'll see how here's it the key here's the key when you have a podcast and somebody asks you about it you have to plug your podcast that's the way it works man tell yeah. people the title at least <laughs> nah, i don't even uh, you don't know? no 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 oh, it is the the 11 with albert rusnak there you i go. believe that's how it works. That's what it is. People but, can get it on. I mean, you once know, I anywhere get, you can get your podcast, same as extra time. Put it second on your listening list, of course. But yeah, but once I get better, then I will try and promote it. But right now, I don't know. It's it's not the best. You know, I'm okay. just getting used just to it. Just amateur for the time being. Yeah, yeah. But you're a pro in what matters, which is 
The well, game, soccer. Yeah. Well, I hope I am. 2019, <laughs> Real Salt Lake. Yeah. Was an interesting season. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it was. How was it from a player's perspective to watch all this change happen around you on all levels of the organization and yet still somehow at the end of the year find yourself in the playoffs? I mean, it comes with the job, you know. There's, there's problems, there's, uh, there's drama, and uh, we've had quite a lot of it last year. Um, on the other side, me personally, did it affect me? Not really. Uh, maybe other players got affected more than I did. Um, but uh, I think, you know, once we, we have won a game, then, you know, winning just puts everything to a side and nobody talks about the negative stuff. There were worse times when we lost or when we were on a, on a streak of not winning the games. That's when things got a little bit tougher because, you know, even more media jumped on all the things that were happening around the, the football club. So it's... Uh, it was an interesting season. At the end of the day, we got to the semifinals of the Western Conference, which is in some way an achievement. In some way, you want to go to the finals and mm -hmm. you want to win. Um, so, yeah, I would, I would sum it up as, uh, as you said, that the last season was interesting. How did things change in the transition between Mike and Freddy Juarez? I have to say pretty smooth because Freddy wasn't somebody new that stepped into the role. Freddy was always there. And all the players knew him. Um, the only thing that changed, he wasn't an assistant anymore. He was, he was the main man, uh, you know, in charge. Um, so, therefore, he wanted to stay the same man as he was, you know, that you can joke around with him and, you know, you can, you can chat to him anytime. Um, he didn't change at all once he became the, the full-time manager. But I would say that only my, you know, relationship with him didn't change. But I would respect him now as a full-time manager and I wouldn't you know, joke around things like I used to when he was an assistant. But he, the first thing he said, he doesn't want, you know, to change. He doesn't want us to treat him differently. But in a way of, like, the respect between, like, the assistant manager and, you know, you can chat around with him, whatever, mm -hmm. off the field stuff uh, and anything else, all the problems you have. Once he became a full-time manager, I kind of put that to a side and I respected him as a, as a manager. And I would still speak to him, but not in the same manner that I would before. As you look ahead to 2020 now and start to prepare and get yourself ready, what do you think of the project as it stands right now? Semifinals, fine. Not where you want to be. How do you improve? How does RSL improve? Well, if I had a key to that, then I would just pass it to our GM. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, there's 11 players on the field and there's about seven or eight on the bench. So the players are the most important. So definitely, you know, uh, bringing in uh, uh, a couple more addition uh, players that are going to start, that are going uh, to play some serious minutes this year. I think that would help. Um, and, uh, you know, a good preseason is important because, uh, you know, what, whatever you do, whatever you practice, you know, how fit you get in preseason, that's, that's where you're going to be, you know, using all of that in a season. Because in a regular season, there's no time to really get fitter or get stronger. You know, it's, it's time for just, uh, it's all about the games. At the end of the day, the games, uh, the games matter, and uh, the trainings, uh, it's less, uh, less of a training, less of a run-in. Um, so, yeah, a good preseason. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens with the additions to the team. And, uh, and then it's all about the results on the field, and that will, that will come with, you know, guys staying healthy, you know, many injuries, and, uh, and there's, there's so many factors that will play a key role. But. What is the league now? For you, as you well, I've seen it from three years ago to now, and there's definitely not not like rapid improvements, but there has been some things. Uh, you know, the the teams that are coming in the league, and there's uh, there's more new stadiums that are just built for the soccer use, not like uh, that you rent in a stadium and there's four different sports are played in the in the arena. Um, you know, uh, new academies just like ours a couple of years ago. That's, that's something that you want to see, and that's how the league will get better and will attract more players to come into it. Who are the players you like to watch as you sit down or whatever, you, when you're scouting or looking at film or whatever it may be, playing against them on the field? Who are the guys that you look around the league and say, I really respect what he does, how he plays, what he means for his club? From any other team? Any other team. Around yeah. the league? Yeah, anybody. Um, you could go under the radar. You could go a blindingly obvious and say, you know, we're at Bank of California here. You could say Carlos Vela. I'll leave it up to you. Yeah, I mean, every team has, you know, few few players that either stand out the way they play, stand out how many goals they score or what they mean or how long they played. But for me, uh, Diego Valeria is something at Portland. Uh, 
something that he not just on the field how he plays and what he has done for Portland but also off the field I believe uh, that he is uh, he is a key man in Portland you know and uh, and is in, involved in a lot of uh, the community stuff he does and uh, and many other things you know so he's definitely someone that I respect what's the best thing about living in Utah you don't get to hit the slopes do you that's probably part of your contract <laughs> no, stay off the ski. skis yeah, yeah I don't ski uh, I mean I like uh, I like uh, the piece that's in Utah you know uh um, the nature, shall I say, the mountains. But the, the, the best thing is, you know, like I've been in L.A. for a day and a half and I've been in traffic a day and a quarter. So, you know, living here is something different. It's something that I haven't experienced. Um, could I imagine getting used to it? Maybe, but it'd be tough, I tell you that. Like, it would be very tough for me. So I like the, the peaceful side of Utah. No traffic, peace, just hanging out. Yeah. That's that Utah life. Yeah. Good luck this year, Albert. We talked about it being a tumultuous year for Cincinnati. It was a tumultuous year for RSL as well, and they went to the playoffs. Albert Rusnak, back for another one. See how they'll do this season. Let us know what you think, RSL fans. Hit us in the mailbag. Sounders, no summer <laughs> DP. No chance. João Paulo from Botafogo is here on loan. This feels like a trend. Again, 28-year-old, versatile midfielder, comes to Seattle after a decade in Brazil. He's got a lot of appearances across a lot of competitions because that's the way Brazilian soccer works. It is also a loan with a pretty big front-end loan fee, reportedly. And then at the back end of this year's loan, there is a purchase option. And that seems probably like some salary cap management slash flexibility by Garth Lagerway, i.e. he will be a true DP. Can't buy him down this year, but probably if you sign him at the end of this and to a longer-term contract, you can amortize, and then he could be a TAM player. And again, as you said, Doyle, we don't know what the lay of the land is going to be anyway, so there's been a lot of guesswork here. This makes me happy. As a CCL fever aficionado, mm -hmm. the Sounders, probably the most sort of, uh, I don't know, I, well, they have Ready, the best path. The best path and also maybe the best foundation based on the way last year ended for yeah. them and some of the pieces that they have. You add this one in. Now you have what you're going to say is, is Roldan going to be in the midfield or is he on the wing? I think Roldan's a winger now. Yeah. Uh, no matter what, it's so flexibility. It's, right. Yeah. So it's Gustav and him. And so you could Gustav argue. Gustav be deep. And right. Schmetzer said in the press release that this gives us more vertical passing options in the initial buildup. So Svensson parks it. Mm -hmm. Giappolo. Roams the field, finds the angles, and kickstarts the attack, a.k.a. finds Nico Ladero. Yeah. Does that sound about right? Yeah, and when, and when Ladero had trouble, often he had to check way back deep yeah. to pick up the ball because there wasn't that vertical pass where he could just sort of hang out in between the lines and find space. He would often come even as far back in some matches where he's fr frustrated off the center back or the outside back, and he'll still have that flexibility and freedom to roam, but this alleviates some of that necessity to do that, to allow him to get a little bit more connected with Rui Diaz and with Jordan Morris or whichever side of the field he wants to drift to. So I think that's what they're talking about when they're saying this vertical passing. It's, it's also to give Ladero a little bit more freedom to stay in a more advanced role as opposed to dropping back so save some miles on his legs because yeah. he's you know he's in his 30s now and he's his engine is incredible but he's not going to not going to stay young forever the interesting thing is like this probably makes Roldan the starting right winger which surprises me a little bit but also his movement is so good in the final third he's so clever his timing's really good he combines naturally he doesn't beat guys off the dribble he's not flashy at all but the team's i think been really effective with him out there and part of it is if he's your winger then your right fullback can just go end line to end line and if you think about the sounders at their best last year it was when Lear Dam was basically playing like a sixth attacker so i like it makes it's not the move I thought they would make heading into this offseason. I honestly thought they were just going to go find, uh, find themselves another DP winger. Um, but by adding a DP number eight, it gives them, I think, a lot of flexibility while keeping solidity. The flexibility is great because you've got Jovan Jones who can play two or three spots. You've got Roldan who can play a few spots. There's a potential maybe to start CCL that Svensson is a center back for a game or two, which is fine. Then Roldan drops in, you change it all. It also leaves space for Garth Lagerway to do what he's done well, which is kind of just sneak like an MLS starting player out here or there. Brad Smith, he did it with Jones the first time. Like If he can find talent anywhere, he can make his pieces fit now amongst that because he's got versatile guys. So if he does happen to luck into an out-of-contract winger who can be a real game changer yeah. in MLS – 
just sign him because now Roldan can slide in deeper. Roldan can help out a fullback if that's what you're doing. Whatever it is, they've got a ton of options, and you could argue right now as a starting 11, they're as competitive with anyone in MLS, and then they can try and add a piece or two. Well, to- they're as competitive as long as they sign that other center back. Yeah. Which is not done yet, but yeah, they Marco do Yeah, Marco Andrade it. from Union de Santa Fe. And I'm yeah. pretty sure they sent Sassini to Santa Fe as well. Yeah. So, so they, they maybe expect that to get done. Yeah, look, the, the club announced it, but still waiting on some things there. That would be the other center back next to Xavier Arriaga. Are they the team that you would put your early money on for CCL? We'll do the full CCL preview and we'll really talk through it, but kind of gut. You're saying MLS team? Yeah, MLS team. Well, yeah, if we're going the other way, I mean, you probably <laughs> – let's go. Let's be yeah. real honest about history and what it says about what you should do with your own personal yeah. fun. Yeah, they would – They would. if everyone were to win quote-unquote favorites, they'd face Montreal in a quarterfinal and then Tigres in a semifinal. It's a pretty yeah. tough road, but there's no such thing as an easy road. So, yeah, as an MLS team, I would say they're they're the favorites. Atlanta picked up a new piece. Mateus Rossetto, they're also in CCL via the U.S. Open Cup from Ludico Parnense. He signed on a TAM deal. He's 23 years old, Brazilian, not really like a deep-lying midfield type, it seems, more like an attacking midfielder slash can play on the wings. So you would think he is either depth for Pity or Barco or a replacement if they're on international duty or on form. Maybe he's playing better. If you want to go attacking, maybe he plays the point in a three-man midfield and you go 4-3-3. They have been playing something that looks kind of like a 3-4-2-1. We don't know if that's actually what they want to do. Maybe Frank DeBoer wants to go 4-3-3. But this is one of those signings where you're like, oh, yeah, that, that could be good. I have never seen <laughs> Mateus Rossetto play outside of the like thumping techno Highlight tracks that you get on YouTube. Which Loka actually DJ. Yeah, but if you lose yeah. Nagby and you lose Gressel, you need some flexibility as somebody that can play maybe a couple different spots, especially in that middle to outside portion of the mm-hmm. pitch. So they had to make some type of move to add reinforcements to that area of the field, and hopefully you think he's got something in him to give him some goals. We'll see what uh, happens for them in CCL and the rest of the window, too, because they're a team that you would think, based on what Frank DeBoer said about what he wants, may go out and get more of the Red Bulls. They're just selling all their outside backs. Kamar Lawrence, to Andrew, like, they're all going one place. Same club. You Michael Sasha Maria. has something to do with this? Yeah, maybe. Right. I don't know. I it's... think Vincent <laughs> Company might be up in Section 202 just watching the game. posted up with yeah. Bill Carroll. <laughs> he's probably watching Red Bull 2 games. What's up, legend? Yeah, I, up, <laughs> he's like, I know Dave Gunn. <laughs> That's my guy. So for about $2 million combined on these two, Kamar Lawrence, maybe the best left back in the league. It's not as much as I would have thought. Is it, just, um, is it a writing on the wall situation? Kamara was like, I, yeah. I want to I mean, leave. he literally, it's not even writing on the wall. It's yeah. like request from the player situation, it seems like. Um, it's less than I thought, but it's still $2 million between these two guys. They they traded up to, to draft a left back. Um, they signed John Tolkien, who's a, a really highly regarded homegrown left back. So it's the Red Bulls. They, they think they have their way of doing things. Um, it's mostly worked out for them, especially in the regular season. I like this is just it's part and parcel of what the club is. Uh, but they aren't doing the same old, same old duel. Didn't you hear? They made a hire. They created a new position, head of sport, a, a DP hire in the front office. Yes, Kevin Thelwell from Wolverhampton Wanderers. He was a sporting director there, and previous to that, he was the head of football development and recruitment. Those are a lot of words that uh, mean a lot of things, I'm guessing. And also, he managed their academy for six years. He is now Dennis Hamlet's boss. Yeah. Which is interesting. Dennis Hamlet will remain in charge of day-to-day soccer operations, but he will report to Thelwell. What, what is this? What's Thelwell's title? Say it. Head of sport. That sounds like the most Australian thing yeah. ever. I just like sport. <laughs> I'm head of podcasts. Yeah, for sure. Major League Soccer. So the, the way this sounds to me is Dennis Hamlet has unquestionably done a good job of finding talent in sort of overlooked places in the United States um, and also developing the culture where that talent, whether you're a fourth-round draft pick or a star homegrown uh, or anything in between – you have a path to develop to the first team. Um, What maybe the Red Bulls haven't done as well is sell guys like Murillo and Kamar Lawrence at the top of the market. So Thelwell has those, he has those connections in, in Europe. We, we all know what Wolves has done over the past couple of years. And he was a big part of that. uh, Apparently Um, it's like it on the face of it, it seems like 
kind of a natural move for Red Bulls. It is weird to see a guy go from the Premier League where he had a like a legitimate executive title to uh, MLS, but I think it says a lot about Red Bull's ambition, I guess. It goes along with they brought in a new scouting department from Southampton. They brought in academy directors who were running the Barcelona program yeah. down in Arizona of just – while some fans feel like maybe they're not spending the way they want them to on the field, they are building out the club off the field to be more holistic and more competitive. And it seems like, based on what's happened since Ali Curtis took over, there are deficiencies in the sport and maybe the league that you can take advantage of. They've found some of them, and I think now they're doubling and tripling down on what they've done. And it's just, if we do things smarter and a little differently, we can be competitive. It goes to what Red Bull has done globally. Tom Barlow, six and a half goals. Over. You should have given me 12 and a half. I would have gone over. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Tom Bogert, uh, if any of this news piques your interest, let me know. Tom Bogert says that Andrew Lecter also after Albert Elise, trying to get another cut rate deal. Don't do it, Houston. Houston also uh, reportedly in negotiations per Tom with Granada in La Liga over Mauro Minotas. But they for could Jan Hel Herrera play. Yeah, they could not find a, a middle ground where they could both agree, so that one's off. The Galaxy have loaned Jorgen Skovic to Denmark. Their center backs now, unless I'm counting incorrectly, are Daniel Stiers and Giancarlo Gonzalez and maybe Perry Kitchens. So, uh, Dennis DeClosa, time to make a center back signing, I would think. Mm -hmm. Don't see any rumors out there about it, though. So Not many. We'll see how that goes. Winston Reed, you may know his name from... Uh, West Ham, he hasn't played in two years, basically. Reportedly headed to Nashville FC on a six-month loan. Then he would, if he gets it going, go back to London in the summer. Maybe, I don't know, that was in the New Zealand Herald. You'd think they'd have a Ooh. pretty good in on what Winston Reed is You're going to do. You're always reading the New Zealand Herald. I'm a big Herald. New Zealand Herald guy. Chicago Fire are reportedly close to signing uh, Rafa Vienna defensive midfielder Dejan Lubashish, I think, or don't know, uh, for $2.8 million. That was, that was actually a really good effort, I think. You think so? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. 22-year-old Australian d defensive midfield. Yeah. Austrian. That's Oh, Austrian. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sport. Yeah, it's, I blame <laughs> you for the sport comment. Yeah, it seems like they, the heavy rumors were was Jimenez, a 28-year-old in Argentina, and he was going to come after the Argentine season was over and be the big designated player there. They've moved on from that. They've moved on from many things. Yeah. But I would... Which, which you could say credit to them. For, so at this point in the calendar... It's not, I don't think, about being the best team you can on March 1st, first game in Soldier Field, whatever. It's about making sure you get this right to be competitive going yeah. forward. Don't AKA, screw up and put a bad... Right. Garth don't Lager do it with FC it, Cincinnati. Garth Lagerwey calls it dead money. Don't yeah. put dead money on your books just to put some money on your books. Basically. Also, look at the profile. He's an Austrian player, right? Yeah. Look, look, look at all the signings that we've talked about today on the show. Inter-Miami profile. Then we go to FC Cincinnati, the connections abroad to, to the Netherlands. This is similarly a player that you would imagine the staff would know and yeah. trust and think would fit into the profile of what they're doing. So everybody keeps thinking, oh, Mexican, we're going to sign all these Mexican players for Chicago. And it's like, really? Yeah. Like, like three we're probably going to sign more Austri uh, Austrians. Not Austrians. You almost went Australian. <laughs> like, I'm an uh, yeah. Australian. Used to play for uh, Chicago Fire. A-League, baby. Bring them back. No. A-League. Uh, you almost went to the A-League one day, didn't you? It was a dream. Yeah, I thought I, thought I was going to go off into... Uh, um, Play for Gold Coast. Yeah, like just spend it. I had a dream of spending like a year or two there, just at the end of my career. For the Newcastle. Gym. Then I was like, you know what? Extra time. It's calling me right <laughs> oh. now. Let's go. You know, Bruce Arena says he learns something from this podcast, and does he? Yeah, I mean, so I, did I. Honestly, I knew. Yeah, I, think I knew none well. of those he rumors, so I, I, don't know I, I feel he, the same way. I don't know if he was uh, Bruce if he Arena meant that. Meant. I don't listen to podcasts because I didn't probably like this. probably <laughs> uh, before we get out of here. U.S. national team January camp won a win against a pretty, pretty good Costa Rica team. Veteran vet Costa Rica team. Veterans in that squad. Uh, Uli got a PK in his first ever game. I mean, it's 23 years, 216 days on average. How old that 11 was. It's the youngest starting 11 in January camp history, which is that's pretty cool. I'd imagine it's the youngest starting 11 ever. For, for the full U.S. national. But anyway. I don't know that We've number. done some so weird stuff that, over the last few I won't make years. that claim. That's <laughs> true. Very the Dave Sarakin yeah. games yeah, in Europe. Yeah, 2018. Yeah, yeah, Four players in that 11 got the first cap. All 20 are younger. Uli, Jesus Ferreira, Sam Vines, and Brennan Aronson. Another three came off the bench to get their first cap. Brandon Cervania, Chase Gasper, and Mark McKenzie. Others who are established had good games. Uh, Reggie Cannon seems like he always looks good at this point. Always up to uh, the level. Jackson Ewell, I thought, had a, had a pretty nice game. And I really, Uli, every time he got the ball on that left flank was exciting. You kind of sat back and said, oh, what's he going to do? There wasn't always 
the final ball. There wasn't always the final piece, but he was aggressive and he was confident. And for a guy his age and in his position, not yet broken into the first team, uh, you love to see it, as they say. Who are the winners for you, Doyle, in this camp and in this match? You know, like my nerves, actually, I think is a, is a big one because usually these games are terrible. January camp games are, are like they're out of season and they're – Usually, like severely weakened team, weakened teams that have no ideas. Um, this was a weakened team, but they had ideas, and they uh, they just about executed on them. They didn't, as, as Weeby said, the final ball wasn't there. Whether it was Uli or mostly Paul Ariola, uh, Jesus Ferreira like opened up some of the field with his link up play, but then he wasn't dangerous off the ball himself in the final third. Uh, but they had ideas and they executed really well. And seeing them do that was a relief for me because. Olympic qualifying starts on March 20th, and guys like Christian Pulisic, Tyler Adams, Weston McKenney, Josh Sargent, Serginio Dest, Tim Weah, Gio Reyna, who's a Bundesliga regular now. Mm, God, it's so great to hear all those names. Right? Well, none of them are going to be with that team. Uh, well, you know, Teams so are not hear. under any obligation to release players for Olympic qualifying. It's just not in the FIFA statute. So the Jason Christ is going to have to go down the list and find other difference makers. And while... Uliana's wasn't quite it from the run of play. You could see why he's he's scoring goals for fun in the youth ranks in, in Germany. Um, Jesus Ferreira showed a lot of his quality in link up. Jackson Ewell and Reggie Cannon both looked really really solid. Um, Brendan Aronson wasn't great, but like it was his first cap. Mm-hmm. You know, so like Mark all, McKenzie got his first cap. Mark McKenzie hit a couple of very nice passes as well. His ideas in terms of distribution from the back, all of that against a veteran Costa Rica team, five World Cup veterans would have been six if Madrita hadn't gotten hurt before 2018, but he was out there as well. Um, it was it was really encouraging. There's still a lot of work to be done, but you could see why the like these cohorts of players, the 97s, the 99s, the 01s, have done more at the youth levels than the 95s, 93s, 91s. On the field, like collectively what did you see because it's a month to drill yeah there were some moments where it felt like oh they're they're there's some pressure here like higher up the field than we have been accustomed to yeah seeing. i would say one thing that popped out is the few times costa rica did press they looked more comfortable playing through it when yeah. early in greg burhalter's time guys knew that the expectation was to keep the ball on the ground and find feet and didn't understand how to do that put themselves in really bad situations you saw here Guys ready to bail them out, give them options, um, a willingness and a quick, uh, a quick ability to play back, to bring the pressure even higher and then break through that and go back up the field. Some pre-ideas of the wingers cutting in to allow the fullbacks to get up the lines and Jackson Ewell or Mark McKenzie or whoever it was to hit those long passes. Defensively, they made a couple turnovers in transition that they recovered on. Um, all the chances they gave up were basically offset pieces. And then I would agree, they pressed a little bit higher. They were more aggressive when they were able to turn the ball over. And I think, I thought Jesus Ferrer was a really big winner in this one. I don't know how he plays the number nine position, but he creates things. And I love the way he dropped off. And as the center but mids after went he wide. he dropped off, he didn't make that hard Agreed. center forward run. Agreed. He has to make that run. But he comes in, he gets the ball, he's comfortable in the middle of the field with guys around him, and Ariola and Linez and whoever else was around him was making good runs off him. Those were most of the chances they created over the first 45. So it was a good showing, I think, from a lot of those guys. And then you have guys like Vines and, you know, Cannon or McKenzie where it's just like, the fact that you don't look out of place is a positive at this age going towards the Olympic qualifying. I mean, a lot of this, right, is is these players have promise, but there are holes. And mm-hmm. so these are opportunities to see how maybe they cope with those holes. I mean, Uli has not been getting first team minutes. Can he play at this level? Can he play with the senior national team? He showed that he can. Jesus Ferreira, can he, what, what is he? Is he a nine? Is he more like a second forward? And he showed that ability to drop between, and Brian McBride was praising that at halftime. That's high praise from a, a forward who knew how to drop in and sort of create for teammates, but then Brian McBride would be on the end of things, and he wasn't there. Areola, the final product. Jackson Ewell, he's just kind of solidifying himself. Brendan Aronson, again, it's the final product. Yeah. He knows that. Yep. Berhalter said it. So has Jim Curtin. He said it. I have to add that to my game. I mean, that's what this camp is about. Guys trying to find that next little step in their careers. And the idea is if you can do this, play this well. And they did They did play very, very well, really, against something close to the full Costa Rican national team. Then you expect them to really impose themselves upon the Costa Rica U23s next month when these two teams meet in Guadalajara with 
potentially a berth in the Olympics on the line. All right, mailbag time. Oh, you got something? Sorry. Well, no, I, I just like to see more of Ferreira. I, I think that he has more to offer, and he's the type of player that um, – amongst better players is actually going to look a lot better and rise to the occasion because he, because of his intelligence and the way he combines with people around him. So if you put him maybe more with more dynamic wingers or more experienced wingers, that ability to drop deep and connect and facilitate and play, I thought his pressure was also excellent throughout the game, especially for a young player having that type of understanding. So, you know, I, I, I caution against making these types of comparisons, but the role that Firmino plays for Liverpool as well. is yeah. a similar thing where it's not necessarily the end product with the goals. And, and that is there, obviously, for a yeah. player like that. that. I think that is can also be there from Ferreira. We've seen some of his finishing ability in MLS. But I would like to see him get a chance maybe more with some established players around him and see if he could actually raise his level. So let's end on a mailbag question, which goes straight to this. What's the starting midfield for FC Dallas? Is what one fan asked. You can expand it to the front six. If you want to say they're playing a 4-3-3. Three, three. Okay, we'll start at the 6. Tiago Santos is going to play the 6. I think that's pretty clear. He provides something they didn't necessarily have all the time last year, which is just like no nonsense, ball recovery, clog the passing lanes, get it, and be clean, finding the feet of whoever it is around him, whether that be spraying it to the fullbacks who are pushing up or the 8 or the 10 or the wit, whatever. He'll start at the 6. How about the 8? Servania or Acosta? Brandon Cervania made his debut for the U.S., or by Paxton the way. Or Paxton Pomichol. Or Paxton Pomichol, so I, I but think I think Pomichol is going to be on the wing. Interesting. That's what I think. What about my boy Cerio? Cerio is yeah, probably, he's backing Edwin? up Santos, man. He's just, man. he's the understudy, I would think. He was a starter last year at the beginning of the year. That's fair, but then he wasn't at the end. <laughs> he, so? sh- he struggled last year yeah. after the yeah. U-20 World Cup. Cervania was a starter when the year ended. Mm-hmm. And then they went out and got, as you said, a veteran center mid. Yeah. So does anyone? Who have would it? you go with? Brandon Costa, Honduran international. I mean, I think this is the this is the point of preseason camp is you you let them you let them fight it out. They were much better last year with Acosta in the lineup, even though Acosta as a player kind of drives me nuts because of his decision making. Well, that's why Tico Santos is there, right? Yeah, I think he's so. the he's the like security blanket of hey, yeah. Brian, we know you're gonna like roam the, a little he's bit. He's their Gustav Svensson. Yeah, this guy's just gonna post. Yeah, so I, I think that. My money at this point would be on a 4-3-3 with kind of the dual eights thing with Acosta and Pomacall as starters um, in central midfield. I don't think that Pomacall is there to start on the wing. I think they're, the wingers are going to be Barrios and Fafa Pico. I think they got Fafa Pico with the idea that he's going to start. I could see that. I could see that. Wait, I'm sorry. So you had Pomacall and Brian Acosta starting in central midfield alongside Santos. Yes. No, kind of in front of no Santos. No true okay. 10 is what he's telling And then you, who is your center forward? Uh, I think Cobra at this point. So Jesus Ferrer is not so a starter. Jesus Ferrer, who was darn near 10-10 and 10 last year. Mm-hmm. Is not a starter not a for starter. FC Dallas. I, I don't necessarily think so, though. He has the ability to compete for the starting job at the center forward, at the left wing. I mean, he could conceivably outplay... Fafa Pico, uh, or if they invert that triangle and they go with a four-two-three-one, he's maybe more of a natural ten than Pax and Pomacall is. But like this is the thing with Jesus Ferreira is it, his best position is probably as a second forward. This team doesn't play with with two forwards. I don't know about Pomacall either because I think he will be eased into it as we've seen with the yeah. national team and injuries. That's the other sort of. Well, the hardest part for this is you talk about a chance to win the job, but then you disappear to go to the Olympic qualifying yep. for some of these guys. So, like, what if you build this whole time? Ferreira has a good run, but then he goes to Olympic qualifying. Cobra plays well. Yep. It, it kind of th- – there will be an interesting Isn't case. Isn't this what you want, though? Like, this is, this is what we talk about with, with MLS. It's like, oh, we, we've never had depth. Well, you have depth now. So every time you go to practice, it's your chance to win the job. And also, but, what is a starter, right? Like, what, like, Cobra is a starter when he's hot. If he's not, then it's his is Ferreira, right? Yeah. So, it's like, you have to have that competition, especially amongst the forward group. If you're just going with one number nine and he has the exact same qualities as the next yeah. guy behind him, you have to have some diversity amongst the attack, especially when you're going to lose guys for international duty um, and the Olympics. And here but comes Hara in the said, summer, too, by the way. Yeah, 100%, which changes everything. Teams don't have to release players for Olympic qualifying. By the way, it, to our listeners, if you're looking for a drinking game to play during extra time, anytime David says 100%, okay. you will... A hundred percent not be able to stand at the end of the show. 
I'm here. Two to broken help my feet. People. I'm here to help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I can yeah. lend you my camera. Yeah, don't, don't start running around. I think that's probably it from us here today. Thanks you to Jurgen Lokadia for joining us, Loka, as we now will refer to him forevermore, uh, and as well as uh, Albert Rusnak and Hani Mukhtar for sitting down with me in LA, and to you guys. We'll be back on Thursday with much more. Hit us up with the mailbag. If you want us to talk about something, it's not our fault if we're not talking about your team. Prompt us. We'll see you on Thursday, everybody.